Okay, so we are talking about the uh, promise and perils of AI. This is the third lecture. Um, we talked about the fact that uh, human intelligence is to uh, um, basically uh, create tools to enhance our capabilities. That's to, well, we use our intelligence for that. Um, <coughs> And we talked about AI, the artificial intelligence. Uh, I mentioned that the world is improving, improving, and uh, if we use this metaphor of <coughs> intelligence on a railway like this, we have different station. The artificial intelligence is way behind here. We have animal intelligence. We mentioned the fact that animals are also intelligent, and we are the best there, the far away there. But uh, AI is moving, and it's not going to stop there. It's continuing, and it actually may, may go beyond our intelligence. So we talked about uh, achievements in AI, um, many amazing achievements. Uh, we talked about the fact that, uh, yeah, we have different uh, levels of intelligence, what I call sub-intelligence, like the animals, our intelligence, and maybe there is super-intelligence beyond us. Okay, and that's what we will call the uh, technological singularity. And I think I finished the lecture last time saying that there are four paths, according to me, to reach that. One is evolution, uh, by selecting the embryos that will become intelligent. Is that ethical? I don't know, I don't think so. But actually, did you hear about the monkeys that were cloned in, in China? first time they cloned identical macaques, I believe. Um, so it brings us closer to the possibility to clone humans, which is amazing. Um, we can't do that here, <laughs> but in some countries, that's why we, when we talked uh, last time about uh, legislating some of these things and putting restrictions, it makes no sense because in other places they can do it. Um, Anyways, the other path was uh, this strong AI, the machine will make it uh, smarter and smarter and one day it will become as smart as, as us and it will uh, <coughs> improve itself. And that's the path that most people are thinking about. Uh, the other path is the uh, cyborgs, so we will enhance ourselves by adding these mechanical devices and things and we'll extend our memory, we'll extend our capacity to think or who knows what. Um, and then the fourth path was the Internet of Things. So putting all these smart or semi-smart pieces together connected, maybe some uh, intelligence were, would emerge from that. Um, so, um, and I also mentioned the, res the, the, the resurgence of AI today. Why is it happening today? Because we remember I talked about the uh, roller coaster we went through, the two windows of AI, so it's going up and down. Why is it coming back now? Uh, well, because we are collecting a lot of data. Uh, our machines are faster and faster, but also we're improving our, our uh, algorithms. Uh, we are having amazing, uh, so amazing and sophisticated com uh, algorithms like uh, deep learning, <coughs> which is um, assumed to simulate how the brain functions. Okay, um, and deep learning is so uh, surprising with the achievements that people are actually associating it with AI. I mean, not, it is associated with AI, but people are using it as a synonym to the term artificial intelligence. Okay, um, I also mentioned the fact that AI has many goals and many subfields. Uh, among them is learning. Okay, the goal of learning, the machine, we would like the machine to learn. And this is, this is what we call machine learning. It's a subfield in AI, and it's the topic of this final, for me, final lecture <laughs> on AI. <coughs> okay, so this is a quote that I got from uh, the Wired magazine to say, you need AI researchers to build the smart machines, but you need machine learning experts to make them truly intelligent. So what are these machine learning experts? And well, well what is this machine learning? So machine learning um, uh, is a discipline within computing science. It's part of AI. 
And the goal of this uh, field is to design uh, programs that uh, would allow this computer, this machine, to uh, well learn from the data and change its behavior based on that data that it, it saw in the past. Okay. Um, <coughs> so machine learning would provide means to the computer to learn from large data and uh, adapt to new data that it sees in the future. <clears throat> As opposed to some static programs, static programs it means that they are specifically programmed for a particular task. Here, you're, you, you program them to learn, but the task can be different. Okay. So they're not specifically programmed for that task, they are specifically programmed to learn. Now I'll show you some examples. <coughs> okay, so these pro these programs will learn from experience. The experience is the data that we give it, and then it will adapt to the in the, in the environment, meaning new data that it will see. Um, so the best way to explain it is to show you examples of programs. This is what I've been done in the past. And I'll show you some complicated programs. I'll tell you whether they are machine learning or not. And then you'll see why, what, what is this machine learning. So imagine an accounting program. An accounting program can work for this company, can work for another company. The same software many companies are using. So you may think, oh, it's adapting to different companies. Well, this program that may have millions of lines of code <coughs> allows accountants to keep track of the expenses and the money coming in, money coming out, and, and so forth. And different companies indeed have different expenses, except that they follow very specific rules. They're regulations. If you have this expense, it goes to this account. If you transfer from this account to that account, this is what you do. And all these rules are hard-coded within that program. So it doesn't really adapt to different companies. They all have exactly, they all follow the same rules, okay? <clears throat> so that's not machine learning. Okay, maybe querying a database. You have a large database with a lot of data. <clears throat> different people have different needs from that data, okay? Different information needs. Maybe that's adaptation, because I talked about adapting to the environment. Well, again, that's not really adaptation. Whenever you have and an information need, you express it in a query language. The typical query language for databases is called SQL. And that uh, uh, query is interpreted, optimized, and you retrieve the data, boom, there it is. Okay. It's not really <coughs> um, adapting, it's not really machine learning. Okay, and maybe programs that use robots. Okay, robots are typically associated with artificial intelligence. So I take a robot. A robot, for example, in a manufacturing plant. I'm building cars. Many of these manufacturers building cars use these robots. Okay. Now, I program it to go a particular place, X, Y, Z, and uh, put a pressure or weld something or whatever. So there's some te particular temperature, some particular pressure. If I change from one model to the other, my robot will not adapt. I have to go and say, now the new coordinate XYZ is here in space. Okay. So again, it's not adaptation. It's a program that sends uh, uh, commands to the different arms, depending upon the uh, uh, degrees of freedom that they have, and where to go in the, in the space, and what kind of pressure, what kind of temperature, and so forth. It's not really adaptation. Even though it's a robot, so, give me examples of machine learning. Well, here are some examples. These are not machine learning. Imagine you have a program that needs to help a radiologist identify where there is a lesion, a problem. Cancer, for example. I'm using mammography and I want to know if this breast has cancer or not. I cannot write, I cannot ask a programmer to write a program that can do that task for all the possible images that exist. 
it's infinite every single image is different okay? I can't write it in terms of uh, uh, rules and follow these rules and put them in the code and, and that's it so the way it works you will show enough images to the program that have a lesion that is cancerous and say that's cancer and you show enough images that are with lesions that are benign for example or no problems and you say these are fine and the program that has been uh, uh, coded the, its task is to go through these images recognize the visual features in there that discriminate between different groups and it learns after a while to recognize this has cancer this doesn't have cancer so it is adapting to new images that it has never seen before based on images that it saw before. And that's the experience that we talked about. Okay. <clears throat> so this is using machine learning. Any other example? Well, filtering data for an analytics or other kind of data that I'm filtering. Who uses Facebook here? The others don't. Really? I use Facebook. I'm not ashamed of that. I uh, use it for many different things. Um, so for those who use tools like Facebook, if you have many friends that are active on the tool, on the software, on the news feeds that you will get, the, 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 the how do you call it, the, the, when you connect and you get all the news that are coming in, if you get all the activities of all your friends, you'll get too much information that you don't need. So a company like Facebook uses machine learning to look at your activity in the past, what you liked, what you shared, what you commented on, and it recognizes things that, ha that have a high probability that you will interact with and will give those a, a priority to appear on the, feed, the news feed. Okay, make sense? So, but what you like, what you share, and what you comment on is not necessarily the same as what somebody else in your community is also seeing the same things, but he or she will not comment and like and share the same things. So even though you may have the same friends, you may not see the same thing. Because the program learns based on the experience that it had with you, observing you, to adapt to the new information coming. So that's using machine learning. Here's another example with robots. I'm sending a robot to Mars, or I'm sending a robot to a, a disaster zone after an earthquake. I cannot program in the robot the map where to go. I haven't been to Mars. I don't know when, what will be there. So I can't program it. I can't go to the disaster zone. For, imagine there's a, 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 a nuclear power plant that had a problem. It's, it's, there's radiation. I can't go there, and I don't know how things changed. A, a wall fell, a tower fell, whatever. Okay. So I need to train a robot to be able to take decisions and change direction based on what it will encounter in, for, in front of it. So it will adapt to that environment. I'll train it before, it'll see other experience before, and then I'll release it in this new world. Make sense? So you see, those use machine learning. That's not machine learning, this is machine learning. The question is, how do we do that? How do I make the machine learn something such that it can adapt to the new environment? There are many kinds of learning. There's what we call supervised learning. Supervised learning means I supervise you, the machine. Supervising means I will show you enough examples. Uh, do I have a pen? So this, this is a microphone. This is a microphone. This is a mi I'll do it a million times and the machine will end up realizing this is a microphone compared to this is a, a pointer remote control. Okay. This is a remote control. This is a remote. Enough of those. What does that mean? It means I, as an expert in recognizing between a, a microphone and, and a pointer, I will have to label enough of these images to say that's an image of 
a, a, a microphone, this is an image of a pointer, and show them to the computer. And it has to do it many, 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 many times, enough that it will create a model that discriminates between these two. Okay? That's called supervised learning. So supervised means I have to have enough data that has been labeled by an expert. It's a luxury. You don't always have that. So um, there is what we call also semi-supervised learning. There is also what we call active learning, where I have I don't have enough of these labels and there are, there are techniques to allow me to enrich that. <coughs> the unsupervised is when I train the system without showing it anything that has been labeled before. Okay. So, for example, I give it enough pictures of uh, uh, remote controls and uh, uh, microphones and say, well, find two classes of different things. Okay. I am, I'm not showing it things that have been labeled. They're not labeled. I don't know which ones have microphones, which one have remote controls, and say, well, just find me two groups or three groups or five groups. Okay. This is what we also call clustering. There's also learning which is not clustering, and I'll, uh, which is unsupervised learning, but it's not clustering, and I'll talk about it uh, here, for example, reinforcement learning. Um, okay, since we are there, we'll talk about reinforcement. Reinforcement learning, and I mentioned last time, it's based on um, annual behavior, how we learn. So we tend to uh, uh, try to maximize some profit, uh, either it is food or pride or who knows what, uh, and, and because we're trying to maximize that, we'll, we'll, we'll choose the actions that will lead to that maximization. Uh, <clears throat> and I reinforce it by getting, giving a reward or penalty, or what we're trying to maximize. I think I have an illustration that I showed you before. So, um, I have an environment, and I have an agent, it can be a program or a robot, whatever, I am presenting here by a robot. The, the, this agent has uh, um, some actions that at, it could take at a given state, and then it will choose an action, but each action will make a different change in the environment and will result in a different reward. So I will try to get the action that gives me the best reward. That action, I choose a tool here, uh, <coughs> and an interpreter observer will tell me, oh, the environment has changed, and here's a reward for what you did. So my goal as an agent is to maximize these rewards that I'm getting, like the, the dog getting biscuits. Okay. <clears throat> and here I'm not supervising. The only thing I'm giving is a feedback when an action was taken, say, okay, it was good or bad. Okay. So we call it unsupervised. There's also transfer learning is when you learn in one environment and then you transfer that knowledge to another kind of problem. Uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on the supervised learning. So supervised learning is the most common one, is the case where I will show you different cases again and again that are labeled until a model is built. So here's an, a, a metaphor, an example. I have n buckets. The buckets are colored. Let's say these are classes. Okay. Um, in the case of cancer, no cancer, okay, the example that I showed you before, there can be two buckets. Okay. So here I have n, whatever that n is. n could be 2, could be 10, could be 100, whatever. And then I have a pile of balls. The balls have different sizes, different, sh different well not shapes, but let's say different structure, different colors, different weights. These are called the attributes of that object, okay? the features. <clears throat> and then I have a child next to me, the child is representing the computer. And I'll say, watch me. I am going to take a ball, assess it, and then decide in which bucket to put it in. And the child, the computer, is observing me and has to learn to do it later on his own, on its own. So I take the, the black ball, I check the weight, I touch the structure, and then put it in the black bucket. 
uh, the green one, I put it, well, this is supposed to be green, put it in the green bucket. The blue one, put it in the blue bucket, and so forth. After a while, I'll tell the, the, the kid, so did you understand what I did? Can you do it? The child say, oh yeah, I can do it. Here's a green ball, put it in the right bucket. Which bucket will I put it in? Number four? Yeah, because that was supposed to be green. You're right. So, <clears throat> luckily humans are smart enough. Uh, we can guess it in, very quickly. So the child will build the model very quickly. Uh, that's exactly what the computer does, except that the, for the computer we have to show millions of these cases for them to realize, oh yeah, okay. Why? It's because, well, I have many features here too. I, I don't have just the color. Here very quickly you associated the color to the label. But it could have been the weight, could have been a... A, a, a relationship between the, the weight and the color and the size and there are many other features. Okay. <clears throat> There's a subfield within machine learning that, that deals with feature engineering. So deciding which features and selection. So feature engineering can generate new features by combining these features that exist and then deciding what features are relevant in distinguishing between the different classes. So what discriminates between one class and the other. So another uh, visual representation that supervised learning is about having a lot of these training data, so what we call training set. Each record, each object is labeled already. I tell you which class it should go to. So here I'm putting, putting colors. <clears throat> and I have all the data that hasn't been covered, uh, colored. It means that nobody has labeled it yet. It hasn't been seen. This has been seen by an expert, and the expert already put the labels on that, and says, okay, computer, go through that and learn. It will find the features that matter, that discriminate between the different classes, and will generate a model. That model can be a mathematical formula, can be some data structure, can be whatever, different things. I'll make it a, a happy face, it's not just a black cloud. And then I will use that model, apply it to these objects that haven't, that haven't been seen before, okay, and automatically label them. So that's what classification is. So it could be that these are all the messages that you saw before on, let's say, say your social media, your favorite social media. These ones are those that you uh, retweeted or posted again or whatever. These are those that you commented on. These are those that you ignored, these are those that uh, you liked, these are, and so forth. And then I learn a model to distinguish between those that you will like and those that you will not like. Then you have new messages coming in from the activities of your friends, and the model will automatically tell me, oh, these are those that you will ignore, these are those that you will post, repost, and so forth. So I will only display those that you will repost, or so those that you will comment on. Okay, make sense? The question is, what is in that cloud and how is it? How does this program build that cloud? <clears throat> um, there are many challenges as well in the supervised learning. Uh, what are the relevant features here that matter to be able to distinguish between the different classes? Uh, also, what is the algorithm that will do this in an optimized way uh, and, and su such that it's effective? distinguishing between the classes, but also efficient, can do it in a reasonable time. Uh, another challenge is how to represent that knowledge in a model uh, so that I can use it afterwards. And, and another challenge is how do I use it effectively to effectively distinguish with uh, a small error, not, not, not too much error, distinguish between the different classes. <coughs> There are other issues in the classification that uh, one needs to be aware of. There are many algorithms that um, can handle many labels at the same time. We call them uh, uh, multi-class and generate a multi-class model. And other algorithms that are only capable of distinguishing between two classes. We call them binary class classification. So cancer, no cancer. Two things. I can't have many things. <coughs> and that generates a model that distinguishes between two classes. Um, 
another thing that is important to distinguish that um, when I build my model and I have new objects that I need to classify them, many of these algorithms attach to every single object one label. It says it can only be that. While other algorithms are able to say, well, I can attach more than just one label on these objects. Okay. For example, here I have a, a, something coming in, and it can predict you will like it and you will post it. Two things, not just one. Okay. Um, another thing important to know is that this cloud, which is the model that I'm using after learning it, that I'm using to distinguish between the different classes, some of them are black boxes. I don't see what's inside. Okay. We'll talk about some of them later, for example, neural networks, when we talk about deep learning. They're just connections between nodes, and they have weights attached to them. I can't interpret that model. It's just a neural network. It's a black box to me as a user. So when I use it to distinguish between the classes and it tells me this will be highly likely that you would click on it to like, the other one is highly likely that you will repost it. And if I ask the model, why do you say that? Justify your answer, why? It will not be able to explain it to me. It's not explainable. There are some of these models that are actually transparent. You can see inside, so you can see that the model is in terms of rules. For example, it says, if you have this feature and this feature, so it's a conjunction and disjunction of features, then it should be this label. Then when it tells you, yeah, it's likely that you will post, repost this message and say, why? It'll give me a rule because it has these words or because you have other cases like this that, uh, whatever. I mean, it, it can explain it. And we are talking about explainable AI today. It's a very important subfield within the eye. So not only I can see it, but I can also modify it. So I may say, oh, there is another knowledge that I have as an expert that wasn't present in the training data. So the model didn't learn it. I can inject it in there. Okay? And that's very important, particularly in applications in, in the medical domain. In the training data, I don't have all possible cases. There are other cases that I saw as an expert, as a doctor, for example, that were not present there, so I can add them. <coughs> so I can see the model and I can modify the model. <coughs> Another very important thing uh, about uh, uh, supervised classification that is very true in real applications, and often in papers you don't see it because they, they have perfect experiments that they, they run, is this, this issue with balanced training data. So in here, for example, I have as many red ones as I have green ones. So if I learn from that, okay, I'll be, I will build a model uh, that can distinguish between the two because I have enough information from the green that I have from the red. Okay? But in reality, in many applications, I have a lot of one class and not enough of the other. For example, if I'm dealing, I mentioned mammography, if I'm dealing with screening uh, 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 for cancer and breast cancer, um, and you have many women coming to, to do the screening, the majority will be fine. I have a very small subset that will have cancer. So if I use all this data for training, it's completely imbalanced. And when it's imbalanced, what happens is that the model that I will be learning is uh, more uh, uh, biased towards the majority class. Okay, so the majority class will overshadow the minority class. And if I calculate also how many errors I do, well, if 97% are green, for example, and only 3% are red, and here my model will say always green, 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 it's 97% correct. Yeah, so it's, it's actually a big problem. And unfortunately, the majority of the real applications are in this case. You have a lot of one class and not enough of the other class. <coughs> so here are some examples of uh, applications that use machine learning that you are using daily and you don't realize that actually they're using machine learning. Uh, spam detection. 
your email tool is detecting automatically spam and the spam that is detecting it's not based on rules you can not start with rules but if you only put rules the spammers adapt to the rules and the spammers are humans they're intelligent they try to go through the net and they'll put stuff so, such that they trick you and you open the email and you read it <clears throat> then, then they succeed so instead we have a machine learning algorithm within the email client that observes you what you delete what you read and, and, and what you save based on that kind of information these are the labels that it takes from you to learn what you actually consider as spam so when you have a new email coming in it'll know oh that's spam put it in the spam folder okay automatically um, and the beauty of this is that now if you consider spam something that somebody else doesn't consider spam well it'll adapt to different people for different needs because what I consider spam, you may not consider spam, and what you consider spam, you may not consider spam, and so forth. Uh, here's another application that is being used today. When you go for credit approval at the bank, they look at previous customers, who paid the loan, who didn't pay the loan. They look at information about uh, 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 social uh, uh, status. Uh, um, the, does he, ha he or she have a car? Do they own a house? Do they? So these are the features that they get. And based on that and that history, they learn a model. And then you are the new data coming in. They label you automatically whether there's a high probability you'll pay back that loan or not. And based on that information, the banker will decide, yes, they will give you the loan or not. Okay. Um, <coughs> another case where you're using today, and it's uh, based on machine learning, when you buy something with a credit card, there's an authorization that goes to the bank uh, computer. Actually, it's not the bank, but it's the, the credit card computer. <coughs> and it, before it comes back to say yes or no, it actually checks on a model that learned from previous transactions that you had whether that transaction is fraudulent or not. And it will label it for you automatically based on what it learned before. Yes, authorize this or don't authorize this. So this happens today. So how do we do this? There are many models for this supervised learning. Typically what you have, you have data that is labeled by an expert. If we are lucky, we have a lot of that. We will spit it into two parts. We hold out part of it, which is for testing, and we take a big chunk of it for training. We build our model here. Okay. This model we will use to predict the label of these that we kept aside and where we hide the label. We hide the label. If the prediction of the uh, test data is good enough, meaning we get a good accuracy, then we can now deploy it and use it on new label, new, new unlabeled data. Okay. So this is the framework that many techniques use, and there's a myriad of techniques. Okay, nearest neighbors, decision trees, neural networks, Bayesian classifiers, associative classifiers, support vector machines, case-based case -based reasoning, and so forth. There are many, many, many techniques. Why do they all exist? Because there's no winner. Depending upon the application, one technique is better than the other. You go to another application, oh, this technique is actually better. So you have to try different ones. Recently, Deep learning, which is neural networks, is actually uh, the winner in many, many, many of these applications. Okay, that's why it's uh, fashionable to use deep learning today. I'm going to uh, zoom in just still at a high level. Uh, these three methods, I chose these because they're completely different, completely different, yet they do the same kind of output. I have data that is labeled that I want the computer to learn from, and it will generate a model. That model is used to label new data that hasn't been seen before automatically. Okay. <coughs> the first one, uh, k-nearest neighbors, is actually what we call uh, lazy learning. Lazy because it's not going to build any model. It's actually amazingly simple. So simple that we wonder how, how does it work 
in real applications. And it does. It actually gives very good results in many cases. And in addition, it's actually uh, transparent. It shows you, remember I talked about the black box and the transparent box? It's very transparent. So this is how it works. <coughs> um, I'm not going to learn anything. I have the training data. And then I say, okay, I learned. I didn't even look at it. I may have sorted it or something like that. Now I have a new object that I need to label. What I'll do, I'll look in my training data. What, what do I have that is the closest to this new object that I just got to label? What is the closest? And the one that is the closest, I take its label and I say, well, this should be the same label too. Okay. For example, I have all these images that have cancer and images that don't have cancer. So this is the training data. I leave them aside. Now I have a new image and I have to decide does it have cancer or it doesn't. Have, or, or it doesn't. So I will look at the images that I have here that are the closest. Which one is the closest to this one that I have? And I'll take the label of this one says, oh, no cancer. So this one must, must not have cancer. Okay? Simple? Clear? So this is how it works. I have this training data is sorted. Okay? This new entry, I put it in red, means I don't know what it is. <coughs> is it green or is it gray? Green means it's fine, and gray means it may have an issue, I don't know. Cancer, no cancer, for example. And the, the, the decision whether uh, uh, it is this class or that class is simply finding, based on some distance function or similarity function, <coughs> which one is the closest. Oh, this one is the closest. So for this guy, I'll give the green label. Okay? So this one can be a little bit more complicated. I can say, well, instead of taking only one, the closest, I can take, this is that, that's why we call it K nearest neighbors, I can take the K closest to the one that I'm having here, and I make them vote. There's a voting mechanism, it can be weighted or unweighted vote, and then I'll say which label to uh, attach to that new object. Okay? This is lazy learning, because I didn't learn anything. I just looked at these at the time when I needed to label something. Okay. Any question? Is that clear? Simple. Okay. It's really dumb, but it works. So here's another uh, example. So which one I have here? Oh yeah. So now I'm talking. I'll be talking about a completely different paradigm. This is about decision trees, and the main reason I'm, I chose this one is because not only is it different from this approach, but it's an approach that. Uh, um, is very close to what people in medicine do when they are trying to decide about a patient, patient coming in. Do I have this case? No. Go this branch. So I have, I build a tree of decisions. It's called a decision tree. <coughs> Here's an example. It not, has nothing to do with medicine. I have data, observations about uh, whether I play tennis or not. This comes from the original paper that talked about decision trees and, and classification by uh, Quinlan. He had, I think it was about his, himself playing tennis or not. <coughs> Anyways, I may play tennis, P, or I may not play tennis. And the observation is about the weather. The outlook, is it sunny or overcast, or is it raining or whatever? The temperature, is it hot or mild or cold? The humidity and whether it was windy or not. So these are the past observations. The question is, can I build a system that can learn from this data, this experience, and predict. So classification is also kind of prediction. Labeling automatically is this prediction. Can it predict, given the conditions of today, over uh, uh, outlook, the temperature, the, the humidity, and, and whether there's wind or not, and predict automatically whether I'll play or not? And how do I do that? Well, I can build a decision tree. You can see that for outlook, there are cases where I play and cases where I don't play. Well, it depends. If it's overcast, whenever there's overcast, I play. Overcast, I play. Overcast, I play. I never have overcast that is red, which is no play. So if outlook is overcast, I will play automatically. However, if it rains, 
Well, I have rain, some are in the gray, some are in the red, so I don't know. And same thing with sunny. When it's sunny, I don't know. Sometimes sunny is here, sometimes I have sunny here. So at this level, I need to decide again, and I will decide based on other attributes. So for example, if I look at rain, when it's windy and it's rainy, so when I have wind or rain, well, it depends. If it's, wind, if it's windy, I will not. But if it's not windy, I will also play even though there's rain. Okay, based on this data. And same thing on the case of sun. So now I have a tree where these are called leaf nodes, the leaf of the extremities. <coughs> when the leaf nodes are all labeled, I can use this model. This is my cloud now that I represent as a cloud. I can use it for a new case. I have a new case, it means I have a value for each of these features, the attributes, and I will follow my path through this decision tree, and when I reach the node, it'll tell me the prediction. I will play or I will not play. Okay? So that's the cloud that I was representing before, mm -hmm. for the case of decision trees. Now, how do I build this tree automatically? I'm not going to give it to the computer. The computer only gets this data. The computer has to build this. How do we build this? Is it the only tree that I could build out of this data? No. Here it happened that I started asking the question about the outlook. I could have asked the question first humidity. I could have asked first the question about temperature. It gives me a completely different tree. So the, the question is how do I create a tree and how do I create a tree that is actually effective and efficient? I don't want a deep tree or too shallow or something like that. Okay. So how do I build that tree? And there is a technique to build that tree. There's an algorithm to build that tree. It's a recursive algorithm. Uh, I'm not going to go into details here. Uh, but basically, the idea is that I, uh, I put all the cases together, okay, and I will try to find an attribute that best splits them and I choose that attribute, I'll select an attribute, and then I'll split them, and I'll, I'll see if they're all in the same class. If they're in the same class, I label that set with that class. If they're not in the same class, mm -hmm. I have to choose yet another attribute that will best split them. And I split them, I create another level in the, this tree, and then again I'll check if all of them in that set are from the same label, or the majority on the same label, I label it with that class. Otherwise, I have to choose another attribute that best splits the subset and split it again. Okay. So this generates a tree. Um, <coughs> there are many uh, 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 details, of course, that I skipped. Is how do we select the best attribute that splits them? Uh, so <coughs> there are many techniques. The, the most common one is using uh, uh, information gain. Um, that uses uh, information theory, but I won't go into details there. Just to give you an idea about how this is built. And this represents the model at the end. The, the K-nearest neighbors doesn't have a model. It's lazy learning. This one has a model. Okay, that's the cloud. <coughs> Any questions about this one? No. So I can use it not just for the case of uh, tennis, this could be also uh, emails coming in. And the labels here could be spam, non-spam. And I can build a model like this a tree that will tell me, hey, here's a new email, is it a spam or non-spam? What are the features in this case? Could be who is the sender, the time, could be the size of the email, could be does it have an attachment or not could be the words that are inside there, many features that we can extract. That's the feature engineering part of machine learning. Okay. It depends, each application has other features that we have to deal with. Okay, so the third um, technique that I want to talk about is neural networks. And again, it's completely different. It's not like the lazy learning, k-nearest neighbors, and it's not like decision trees. <coughs> So neural networks has been around, the artificial neural networks have, has been around uh, since the 50s. And uh, in the 60s, actually, they built many successful applications with that, except that we didn't have 
very powerful computers, so they, these neural networks are very, very small. And in the 50s, when they, they, they devised these uh, perceptrons, the, the neural networks, uh, they were inspired by what we understood how the, how the brain functions. So the brain has these neurons, the neurons are connected to other neurons, and they receive messages from the dendrite, and then they send it along the axon. And the cell inside has to make a decision when to send that signal. <coughs> How exactly the decision is, uh, is made inside these cells, we don't know. We have a lot of these neurons in the brain. We don't have them just in the brain. We have them in many places, even in the, the, the guts now, <laughs> we know. Um, <coughs> but in the brain, even in the brain, we have different types of these neurons, and we have billions of them not just few like we, we can build on a computer. Uh, the difference is that on the computer, the signals are very fast. They're actually quite slow in, uh, in the brain. Uh, but the brain is capable of doing amazing things that our, the artificial uh, neural networks cannot do, still cannot do. But anyways, the idea is, is it's inspired from how the um, <coughs> cells uh, in the brain function. So an artificial neural network has these artificial neurons and they are organized in layers. So the first layer is what we call the input layer. You have a certain number of these neurons. The number of neurons depends upon the vector that you're giving in here, so it depends upon the application, typically. And then you have an output layer. The output layer has a certain number of neurons and the number depends upon the the class labels that you want to predict. And then you have hidden layers. Apart from the deep learning, deep learning has many hidden layers. In the typical neural networks, you have only one hidden layer, or very few anyways, it's called shallow. <coughs> How many nodes you put in there, um, it's an art more than a science. Often people just do an average between the, the uh, input and the output. Now, of course, with the deep learning uh, uh, networks, you have different architectures uh, <coughs> to create attention to, uh, anyways, we won't go into the details. The important thing here is that the neurons communicate only one layer at a time, so one layer to the other, and each node can be connected to many other nodes in the next layer. Each connection has a weight attached to it. So a node in the hidden layer receives many messages from the different nodes on the other uh, layer above it, and each message comes with a different weight. <coughs> so how it learns, the message is started from the input layer. You provide a vector as input. This is the observation. This is the training data. The training data comes here. <coughs> and then I propagate the message propagate the message till it reaches the output. And that's why we call it feed forward. It, the message goes in one direction. Okay. Um, what else I wanted to say? Yeah, so this is, so the analogy, I have a phone call, no, decline. Um, <coughs> the analogy with a cell is as follows. So the cell gets messages from the synapses to the, the, the body of the cell, and then at one point it sends the message to the axon. Well, it's a similar thing here. Here I have the cell. It's receiving a message from many dendrites, so many, many other nodes from the previous layer. Each one has a weight. The strength of the messages here are different as well. That's the weight. And here they have an activation function that at one point says, after summing up all the messages coming in here, it'll decide, boom, I'll send a message. And that message doesn't, it's not only one, it, it, it goes to all the nodes that it connects to in the next layer. Okay. Now, how does this learn? Well, the learning is about learning the weights. Um, I need to change the weights such that my, for an, an input that has this label, I need to predict that label coming out. So. Whenever I put the training data here and I propagate the, the information up to this point, I will check if the output is exactly what I expected. If it's not what I expected, I have to correct the weights inside here 
such that I would predict the right label. So there are many techniques, but the most common one is what we call the backpropagation. Once I see the error here, I will backpropagate it to fix the, the weights on these uh, uh, edges one layer at a time. I don't know if I have a slide there. Yeah, so this is just to say that the weights here is what I'm trying to learn, okay? And the neural network learns from these examples. I will pass these examples from the input, look at the output, what is the label that has been predicted, and if it's what I predicted, that's great, but if I have an error, that error, I exploit that error to fix these uh, weights <coughs> such that my, my uh, error is reduced, okay? So here's an example, I have my training data, I have the different features, and I have the label. I don't use the label, I just use these features. I put them in my input layer, I propagate it, when I get it in the output, I'll compare it with this one. I compare the label that I have with what this has predicted. If it's not good, then I will reinforce the the weights, I adjust them based on what I realize as, uh, I mean, I, I notice as an error, okay? And there are many, of course, there are many sophisticated techniques that can also learn by adding edges or removing edges or even adding nodes and removing nodes from the different hidden layers. Um, okay. So there are many advantages to neural networks. Oh, okay, so once they learn, I'll go back here, once they learn and they have the appropriate weights. Now I have a new object. I don't know its, its label. I just have the object. I pass it here and what I get here is the label and I attach that label. Say that, uh, that's what I predicted. Okay? I'm not learning anymore. I, I, I know the weights. They're fixed and I use it to predict. So the prediction is actually quite fast. The learning, however, to put this input here and then get the error, backpropagate the error to fix the weights, I have to do it many, 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 many times. Sometimes hundreds of thousands of times and even millions of times, okay? So for example, I put an image that says, well, this image has a dog and it comes back here, it's not a dog. Oh, I have to fix these weights, to do it's a, a dog. But then I have to put another dog, I have to put another, I have to put millions of these images of dogs for the label to, to be correct at the end because now my weights are converging towards something that will indeed predict a dog. Okay. So the advantage is that the prediction accuracy is typically quite high after many of these, we call them epochs. So going through the network many times with many images. It's also very robust when you have errors and noise in your data. Um, however, it takes a very long time to train. And in the case of deep learning, you need a lot of data for it to converge to something that is actually very accurate. The more data you give it, the better it gets. But who has a lot of data that is labeled? Millions and millions of label, labeled data. That's, that's luxury that not everybody can, can afford. Uh, also, a big criticism is that it's a black box. You can't really interpret it. What you get is this connected set of layers with nodes and you have weights. So what does that mean? When you ask it, why did you predict that it's a dog? Why did you predict it's a spam? Why did you predict it's, uh, it's an image with a cancer? It says, because I have these weights. It means nothing, okay? Um, <clears throat> if you have extra knowledge, you wanna incorporate it in that model, you can't. If we go back to the decision tree, if I needed to add my domain knowledge, I can, I can change the tree. It's a human interpretable kind of model. Here, the model is not easy to interpret. It's just these connections and weights. Um, and how to design the right architecture of the networks, of the, 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 the neurons, it's, it's not really science. You have, this is a trial and error kind of uh, thing you have to do. Um, if you make it too small, uh, it's, it's very slow to converge to something. If you make it too big, uh, then the performance is not that great. So it, it, it's trial and error. And of course, deep learning, which is neural networks but with more layers, will inherit all these uh, pluses and minuses. 
Okay, so as I said in the previous lectures, deep learning is basically the same thing as neural networks except that you have many of these hidden layers. And that's why we call it deep. <coughs> so why is it successful? I told you the story in 2012. It was able to recognize images of uh, uh, cats and dogs and so forth. And it, it beat the competition. Uh, surprised everybody, but then they used it for speech recognition and nobody can do better than deep learning. It's actually, it's doing better than humans. Uh, I also mentioned the fact that we used it in uh, machine translation. And uh, even though we don't translate as, as well as humans, but it, it improved the machine translation significantly. Now you can run it on your cell phone and you can, well, it's not really running on your cell phone, it's running on the server there, but it's amazingly fast and you can translate uh, in an acceptable kind of output for now. Um, <clears throat> any questions about that before I continue? Is it clear? Okay. Now I want to show you some examples of uh, the use of machine learning not just deep learning and decision trees and uh, uh, k-nearest neighbors, which is a, a lazy learning. There are many other techniques that have been used uh, from the panoply of techniques that I listed there, uh, but they have been applied in many places. So, for example, when we talk about autonomous vehicles, the car has to recognize these signs. Is it no left turn? Is it uh, watch out, there is a, there's a crossing or a, a speed limit or whatever. How do you recognize the different signs? Well, that's a classification. So every kind of sign is in a class. So now I can use computer vision and machine learning to predict whether that's a, a, a maximum speed uh, 60 kilometers an hour or is it a, a stop sign or is it a, no one-way sign or whatever. Okay. Um, <coughs> Same thing, uh, an autonomous vehicle has to recognize whether it's a pedestrian crossing in front of you or maybe it's a plastic bag flying in because the wind is taking a plastic bag. I mean, how do you recognize these things? There's a case where I have to brake immediately because the pedestrian is in front of me and there's a case where I, I, I don't have to do a maneuver to avoid that, uh, that plastic bag, okay? Um, <clears throat> so machine learning is used in many sub-problems within the uh, autonomous uh, vehicle case. Um, here's another case, handwriting. So uh, when you send an envelope, and this has been uh, implemented uh, for years, and we're using it, if you send an envelope and you write the postal code, it's not a human being reading all these letters. It's a machine. But when you write it by hand, um, well, what's a 6 and what's a B and what's a 3 and what's a 9? People have different handwritings and it's extremely difficult for a machine to recognize the, the different letters and different uh, 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 digits. So we use machine learning to train a system to recognize the different ones and different twos and different threes and the difference between a 3 and a 9 and a, and a 6 and a B and so forth. And it's read automatic. It's not a human being reading all these letters. It's a machine. Okay? And this has been used for really decades already using a neural network. <clears throat> but now, we didn't stop just at these digits. We have also uh, uh, machines that recognize handwriting like this. And as you type, as you write by hand, it's actually writing it with the... It's like a keyboard. You can even do it with mathematical formulae. As I'm writing it here, it, it reproduces it here with a nice font. Okay. All this is using machine learning. Um, I mentioned spam. Spam is also using machine learning. Uh, credit card frauds, I mentioned that. And other financial applications. So imagine in, in, uh, in the stock exchange. So people are buying and selling uh, uh, shares and then you have uh, high frequency trading. People are trading a lot of stuff, but it's in every second you have thousands of these transactions. You can't ask a human being or an army of people to look at these transactions and decide whether they are okay or not. You have machines. And machines use basic, basically machinery. They learn from past experience, from 
past experience and means other transactions that have been labeled by experts, this is fraudulent, this is not fraudulent, and then they use that model to predict automatically these, these transactions coming in. <coughs> we use recommender systems. Well, recommender systems use machine learning also to improve their recommendations. Um, um, adaptive interfaces. Uh, I mentioned to the interface like Facebook, the, the, the news that are coming to you are filtered using machine learning, but you can imagine also, well actually there's not a question of imagining, it exists, you have remote controls that learn from your behavior. For example, remote control for a TV, it knows which channels you like and which channels you don't like. So you skip them all the time, you don't stop there. So it learns and after a while it doesn't even show you that channel anymore, it skips it automatically. And if you are many members of the family, each one has different needs. Well, there are four different, actually, uh, that's what the one that I know anyways, has four buttons. You say, I'm the red. So now you use it, it knows you, what you like. Somebody else uses the remote, says, I'm the green. And it knows that person, what kind of channels they want. So we have also machine learning in these kind of interfaces. This is a case um, of uh, uh, an interface uh, with the, the, the brain. This is a paraplegic who, um, I don't know if I mentioned this application before, uh, this is a paraplegic who cannot use his hands or her hands and, and the legs and is sitting, yet they want to control the, 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 the wheelchair or they want to control the cursor on the screen. They want to type and they can't. So this uh, interface is just a, a, um, a cap with some sensors <coughs> that uh, detect the different uh, uh, activities, the, the, uh, the electrical signals that we have in the brain when we are trying to do some tasks. And basically we ask them to think about moving a finger or moving a, a toe, or moving an arm that they can't, but they can think about it and that generates a signal. And then if, when we capture those signals, we can attach them to different uh, uh, actions. Like for example, moving the cursor left or moving the cursor right. Uh, uh, or moving the wheel forward or stop the, the wheelchair forward or stopping the wheelchair. And then when they want to send that command, they just think about moving the, the finger. Moving the finger means moving the cursor left. So we, we train a, a machine learning algorithm to recognize these different uh, <coughs> signals. And then once we can detect them properly, then we can deploy it and say, okay, now I can use a cursor. And then they see the alphabet in front of them, the cursor is moving underneath the letter, and then when they stop, they select that, and then they can write their words without even moving their fingers or their legs. Same thing with the wheel. Okay. So we use machine learning for that. Um, some other examples, so I'm gonna show examples in medicine. Uh, this is the case of um, automatically detecting um, whether um, uh, a person is estrogen, estrogen receptive, positive, or uh, negative. This is for uh, an adjuvant treatment after uh, breast cancer treatment with chemotherapy, for example. Um, so um, hormonal therapy depends upon whether we are ER positive or negative, and the different drugs that we provide, and uh, we can learn that from uh, past patients where we know that they are ER positive or negative based on the expression of the, the genes that they have, so microarray data. Uh, and, and we build a classifier based on this data on past patients that we know of. Then we have a new patient and we can use this classifier to predict whether it's ER positive or negative and then based on that information we can uh, recommend which treatment, adjuvant treatment to do. Um, the same technique can be used for many, many, many uh, other uh, cases, so uh, predicting breast cancer, uh, uh, prognosis of uh, breast cancer, who will relapse after a certain time, uh, kidney transplant, who will reject this kidney, who will not, uh, um, uh, who will lose uh, uh, muscle mass when they have cancer, uh, prostate cancer, predicting what the toxicity level of a particular um, uh, treatment, so we can either use the microarray data or uh, SNPs. So this is, these are the mutations in the, in the genes. 
Uh, we can also use other data, not just the genetic data. Uh, but basically, we build a classifier based on patients that we know of and the labels that we are interested in. And then we have a new patient, and we use that model that we learned to do the prediction. And that prediction is used to provide uh, decision support for a doctor to make a decision. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So here's an example for prostate cancer. Well, we can do many different treatments, but one of them is radiotherapy. So you bombard the cells with X-ray, and um, there are consequences to that. There are side effects. And the side effects can be or organized in five levels, toxicity levels. So five means death. Zero means everything is fine, and then you have everything in between. So one is, for example, discomfort, vomiting, whatever, or two can be higher, and so forth. And obviously, if I'm a doctor, and I have a patient that has prostate cancer, and I'm, I'm about to give radiotherapy, if I know that this patient will be at four or five, or even three, I'll say, no, I'm not going to give this treatment. It's not useful. But if I know that it'll be zero, one, or maybe two, and I say, oh, that's beneficial. I will help this patient. Okay. So now I can do personalized medicine. I can target different treatments for different patients based on their condition. So how I do that, I will learn from past patients. I build the model, and I observed whether they were in this case or in that case. Okay, so this is my label. I build a model, then that model I have a new patient coming in, and I will say, oh, it'll be low toxicity or high toxicity. And I'll provide that as a prediction. I provide it to the doctor, and if my model is transparent enough, I can actually show why I predict this or that. And it's the doctor who will decide, okay, we will do this treatment or we'll do something else. Not this treatment, because this treatment is not helping. Okay? So this is true as well for other, other cases. This is in the case of mammography. Is another case of uh, predicting the <coughs> the growth of the uh, uh, brain cancer, so that helps me decide when I'm removing the cancer cells how much around the cancer cells I should remove. Because currently, when they actually they don't remove, they, they bombard these uh, cells <coughs> with the X-ray as well and to kill them. But to prevent the cancer to come back they actually also destroy healthy cells all around. Why destroying healthy cells everywhere all around? Maybe I should destroy some on this side, but not on this side, because I can predict that actually they grow this way. So this prediction can help the doctor decide where they will uh, treat the cells. This is another case that I, I really like very much. This is the case when um, a doctor, before doing surgery on the brain and they need to do so these are the slices of the, the, the scans they need to do segmentation in 3d about the place that they will do this uh, surgery and uh, this exercise takes about half an hour it's a very tedious kind of job so we learn from past segmentations and we do the segmentation automatically but it's not final we provide it to the doctor as a starting point and the doctor will adjust it and instead of spending 30 minutes to do it, they do it in five minutes. Okay, so we're helping them using machine learning, and it learns from past experience. Okay. So this is why I was saying that machine learning and AI in general, it's a tool to help us do what we do, but better. Okay. It's not something that's replacing us. I'm not replacing the doctor here. I'm providing a tool to the doctor to do their job better. That's it. Any questions? I hope you learned something. I didn't put you to sleep. I didn't see any reaction. I, I want to have some questions. Yes, are thank all you. Of the, the, all of the medical applications you went are all of them available? Like, are they becoming available for use clinically, or are they more still? That's a very good question. So, any medical application of this needs to go through very rigorous kind of 
uh, process to approve it before it is deployed. So it's approved by organization like the FDA, um, in the States and Canada, the same thing. And it takes years. So there are different ways of doing it. Uh, it depends what kind of tool, if it's a drug, and so forth. For example, this tool hasn't been deployed everywhere, but in the Cross Cancer Institute, the doctors who worked with us, actually they're using it. But it's not a tool that is sold that other hospitals are using. It. In order to do that, we have to go through approval first, and that takes a long time. Same thing with, for example, this case. So this has been published to detect whether the patient is ER positive or ER negative. We do way better than the current techniques, less errors, but it hasn't been deployed because it takes a long time to do. So it has been published, and a company has to decide whether that's profitable or not to commercialize it. So the learning phase, is it just limited to the part where, like is it just limited when you're presenting the data to the computer and it's making the model, or with every, like with every Very good question. experience? Very good question. No, 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 you can do both. So often, you just have one training phase, um, and that's it, and then you have your model. And then later, if you collect enough data, you can say, okay, I'll stop, I'll train it again, create a new model. But in active learning, you can actually improve the model as it sees new cases. It reinforces the model, get better, better, better. So then different techniques. Okay. Most techniques, you train it, that's it, the model is fixed, and you use it. If you, if you have new data, then you train it again, you have a new model. Others are dynamic. They can learn, as, uh, the more data you give it, the more it learns. Yes. Uh, you said that unsupervised learning is when they, when the computer groups unlabeled data into clusters. So yes. how would it learn what new data is if there's if there's no no new data. Everything is new data. For okay. example, I have uh, data from customers, and I'm a marketing company. I'd like to group them into groups such that I can target them with different ad campaigns. Rather than treating everybody with the same kind of ad campaign, I'll treat different people from different clusters with a different ad campaign. So that's unsupervised learning in, in, in the context of creating groups that are similar. Make sense? Well, thank you. Okay. I think in next week you will see Patrick. Uh, Rich, Rich first. So Rich will talk about reinforcement learning, which is unsupervised, but it's not the question of clustering. It's a question of learning a model of taking actions without getting any training before. I just repeat the actions and get rewards, and based on that feedback, I learn to choose the right action to take. And I gave many examples uh, before about how this reinforcement learning had made a huge impact. For example, uh, AlphaGo is using reinforcement learning. I talked about the case of the Google uh, uh, Meta uh, uh, Learner. So it, it learns to create uh, 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 machine learning models and it ended up being uh, uh, able to create a, a machine learning model that is better than the best one built by humans using reinforcement learning. Thank you, have a great weekend. Okay, great.